in order for us to, to live and to grow, you know, the things that we consider our mess most often become our message. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we are diving into the topics of self-love, empowerment, African culture and spirituality, and discovering the goddess within. Our special guest today is Abiola Abrams. Abiola is an award-winning author, intuitive coach, Oracle Deck Creator, Transformational Speaker, and International Retreat Leader. Abiola is the first-generation American daughter of multi-generational healers, seers, and farmers in Guyana, South America, who are descended from several West African nations. The founder of Women Manifesting, Self-Love Empowerment Platform, Podcast, and Goddess Temple Circle, Abiola studied sociology at Sarah Lawrence College. Hello, Abiola. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you doing today? Yay, I'm so excited. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you for having me on, Eileen. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, First of all, I love your crown. I love what you're wearing. (laughs) You're all about the goddess vibes. Um, (laughs) Yeah, do you you. want to give us... Do you want to give us a little background of your self-love journey and how did you find empowerment? Yes. Yeah, so um, just so that the listeners know, there are all kinds of, you know, technical things that are happening because I'm broadcasting from Guyana, South America. So just, you know, bear bear with me <laughs> and it'll all work out well. So my self-love journey has been very interesting. Um, it really is a journey of self-love mixed with spirituality. You know, love is definitely my religion. And I think that it started, my journey started with, you know, um, having just a lot of difficulties around anxiety growing up. I was the first person in my family born in the United States. And so, you know, coming from an immigrant family and being a first generation American, um, at the time and place where I grew up wasn't really welcome in my neighborhood. So I had a lot of difficulties um, with, you know, growing up and getting along with people and and all of that. Um, I was really, I was a really friendly person, but I was a very introverted and shy person and it wasn't helped along by the bullying part of it. And so because of these challenges that I had growing up, which were really gifts in strange wrapping paper, I started to look for, because it wasn't finding love, you know, outside necessarily, I started to look within and realize that there is a self-love solution for every problem. So that was the foundation of my journey. And how old were you and what kind of resources led you to discovering self-love? So I think that, you know, it wasn't like a one moment, like a hallelujah, I'm healed Mm -hmm. moment or anything like that. It was, you know, really a journey over, you know, I think probably like all of my teen years from being like a tween all the way through my teen years. And the wonderful thing is that my dad is, in addition to being so many things, a journalist, author, et cetera, he's a multi-hyphenate, but he's one of those hyphenates is a minister. He's a minister. Um, and he was always, he's always been throughout my life, a student of spirituality. So he would have these, um, a lot of like esoteric books in his own personal library and, you know, things like he subscribed to something called uh, the Rosicrucian Digest. And so I had all of these things you know, at my fingertips and, you know, was kind of dabbling and checking them out and reading them. And, you know, he had like motivational stuff like from um, Zig Ziglar and, you know, getting, having this stuff as, you know, a foundation was really cool. And back in the days, Tony Robbins used to do infomercials, these inspirational infomercials. Um, And I used to watch those and they sounded like the books that my dad had and, you know, all of those kinds of things, you know, really, um, for me, we're, we're, you know, of course, unbeknownst to me of where the path would go, but a bit of the foundation, you know, bricks in the foundation for, for what I'm doing today. Yeah. And you mentioned that you are a first gen American. So how did 
your culture tie into this journey? Like, were you the type to embrace your culture, like, and your, you know, where your parents came from, or were you kind of, you wanted to create your own identity? What was that like? Because I do feel like you have a lot of this Af- African culture influence in your work. Yes. So my my culture was very strong. I mean, my my person my personal um, every day and everything was very influenced by my parents, by our heritage, by where we were from. And I wish that I had the insight, you know, or the foresight to be able to say, I loved it. And it was great. You know, I did, Mm -hmm. I did love it. But it also, for me, was something that made me different and made me stand out, which as a kid is the last thing that you don't, that you want, you know, so it added to, you just want to blend in. (laughs) Say that again. I just said as, as, cause for me, I relate, like you just want to blend in as a kid. You don't want to be different, but as you get older, you learn, oh, my culture is really cool. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That's exactly what it was. Um, you know, I didn't want to have like a, a strange quote unquote name. I didn't want to, you know, we ate strange foods. We ate, you know, and, and so having all of these things that you might secretly feel inside are, you know, cool and wonderful and unique. And your parents are teaching you your culture without even trying, as you know, you know, you just reference, you know, just by being. And as now as an adult, it's really cool looking back. But as an, as a child, it was really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Right. So what led you to writing books about self-love? And in the beginning, did you tie your culture to it or was it not there yet? So I feel that's, that's a great question. I think that my culture, my cultural background is so much a part of me and how I approach everything and how I approach life. And I think that, you know, with, without trying, you know, that the things that I'm writing and I'm doing now are purposefully rooted in my culture. I think that, you know, with previous projects, it may have not have been as purposeful, but everything that I do is going to be of my culture. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it just, it just Mm -hmm. is. Um, I, one of the interesting things that I feel like is a wonderful gift is that my culture is multi-layered. So it's not only, you know, Guyana in South America, where, you know, my deep ancestry is from where I am right this minute, but also West Africa, where my, my ancestors were before they came to Guyana. And then for me, I'm very much a New York girl. You know, I'm very much a hip hop Mm. generation, New York City girl. Like, that's who I am. I was in, you know, a rap group when I was 15 years old. You know, so all of those things are my culture, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I love how many layers you do have of your culture. I I can relate to that on my own level. Um, And so in terms of, because, yeah, you mentioned... <clears throat> Sorry, you mentioned you were in a hip hop group. You wrote a play. You came out with all these books. So you've done a lot of things. What has inspired each of these projects or ventures? So it's really interesting. I remember, you know, a while ago asking. There's a there's an African American elder who died actually either this year or last year named Melvin Van Peebles, and he has a fam- He's a he's a director who you know apparently in sometime in the fifties or something fifties or sixties made music in France and he's written novels and all of these things. And I had an opportunity to have a conversation with him about 10 years ago. And I said to him, you know, how do you know if something is a novel versus, you know, a musical project versus a film versus a, you know, whatever it is, because I felt very much, you know, the pressure to pick a lane and stick with it, you know, and be in a box. And he said, let the work speak to you and tell you what it is. And I feel that that very much has been my experience, you know, as someone who has meditation albums, as someone who has written fiction and nonfiction, you know, um, so, someone will say to me, and less so now because people are now seeing that it's natural to be multifaceted and you don't have to pick a lane as much as you had to say 10 years ago. But people will, would say to me, um, you know, which, you know, basically like, which, which is it? Which, which are you doing? You seem like you're doing all of these things. You're doing all this stuff. You're all over the place. And I would say, no, it's all the same thing. It's just the same work being expressed in different ways. So, 
us having this this conversation on this podcast, me writing a book or creating oracle cards, um, you know, me writing uh, a meditation album, those are all different ways of expressing the same the same energy. I love that answer. It makes so much sense. It's it's not defining yourself and putting yourself in a box because it it is one message, but there's so many ways you can deliver that message. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I'm curious to know, I, I know this interview for me, but I love that you were sharing that you had like some similarities in your cultural journey. I would love to to know about that. Are you are you first generation American as well? Oh, yes, I'm also first gen. So I was born here. My parents, my dad's from China. My mom's Chinese, but from Vietnam. So she has already two layers. Like her, yeah. my grandma came from China to Vietnam and then they they came here after the Vietnam War. Um, and then I'm, you know, I'm from California. So I'm a California girl. And I, I do feel like I have all these layers. And even in Chinese, I speak the two different dialects. There's like Mandarin wow. and Cantonese. And those are two two different cultures where my mom and dad came from. So even though we're still Chinese, but it's, it's a blend, kind of like how Africa has like all these different yeah, countries. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I, I like that there's a lot of layers. I've learned to really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with me. I have learned to appreciate it too. It is really cool to, to you know, have these layers and be multifaceted and have all of these different things that you can draw from. It, the cool thing about being an adult, uh, being able to go and appreciate who you are, really. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious about your heritage and your ancestry. Is this knowledge that, like, did your family pass this down? Because I'm sh- like, how long have they been in South America? Like, how how do you continue those stories and that culture? So I'm really fortunate in that my family did pass it down. I thought that everybody's family mm-hmm. did, but I, you know, I'm finding out that no, a lot of people's families, yeah. you know, a lot of people just don't, you know, for, for reasons of trying to assimilate and wanting their children to have a better life and all of those things, you know, a lot of um, immigrant families try to forget the past as much as possible. But my father actually in the seventies had written like the very first book about Guyanese culture, about Afro-Guyanese and Indi- Indo-Guyanese wow. culture. So, you know, and I, so I grew up knowing these stories and hearing, you know, these things. And even with my most, most recent book, African Goddess Rising, African Goddess Initiation, I sat my parents down in their backyard and interviewed them, you know, just like I interviewed a lot of other people for the book, because they do have a very rich cultural heritage. And my mother remembers her great grandmother saying that, you know, we are Ashanti. And then she said that her grandmother would Mm. speak in a language, which unfortunately has been lost to my family. But she said she would speak in this language and they all thought it was funny and they would laugh, but no one thought to be like, well, what is the language? What are you speaking? What is, you know, like they didn't think about it that way. So I don't know how many generations my family has been what in South America. I traced it back when I was doing the most recent work for the book and on um, in, on what it was eight generations on, on one family line and I wow. think six on the, on the other. And I am I am so proud to say that you know the village where my family is from, my maternal and, and paternal families where the village where they're from, that they that my, my mom's family line is on the original purchasers of that village after emancipation, um, the formerly enslaved people, you know, they were working as indentured servants and somehow were able to gather the money to, they wanted to purchase their own village. And, you know, and so that sort of thing. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It just makes me so proud. It makes me really, really proud. Wow. And it's incredible that you can trace back your ancestry that many generations. <laughs> Was that difficult? How did you, how do you even do that? It is it's it's so difficult and and when I say trace back, it's it's literally like dregs like it's not like I have I I can go back and say, "Oh, my great grandmother, you know, great great grandmother did this or did that or you know, it's been by talking to people in my family, interviewing family members, learning things from, you know, there was a family member that I, I 
because I started a, a private Facebook group of just, you know, one group of the family for us to, because we're, we're in the UK, we're in Canada, we're in New York, we're here in Guyana, we're global. So, so that we could share stories and share knowledge. And one of my family members who I had never met in person shared that there was a book that was written that mentioned our family line, that specific family line, and mentioned that um, that my that part of my mother's um, my mother's paternal family line were the only enslaved peoples to keep their original names when they were brought to Guyana because they were brought in order to be healers. In order to be oh wow yeah. so they were already healers at that point yeah like that far back yeah that the 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 wow. enslavers did not want to um, waste their doctors and they thought that you know that somehow that you know the African people were you know a different species or whatever and required their own healers and so yeah so they brought they they came they were here as healers and so hearing that and learning that about my family like just connected so many dots for me you know that this is what we've mm-hmm. been doing for a long time I think that's amazing that that energy of healing has been passed down from generation to generation. I mean, how has that influenced your life? Oh, wow. I think it influenced my life in a way that I see everything as, you know, a means of healing. Your beautiful doggy who's in the background, you know, <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a means of of healing you know, everything, the way we do anything is the way we do everything. It's all, you know, like I said, different, it's, it's all different energetic aspects of the same. And I think that knowing that this is my heritage that, you know, my family has been doing for a long time influenced me in a way that it, I think it made me more confident because it's really daunting and really, you know, it can be really, frightening to use words like healer, you know, especially Mm -hmm. in the current climate that we live in where it feels, it can feel at times, especially if you're a person with anxiety, that everyone is waiting to pounce and being like, you know, who are you? How dare you? Why would you say, you know? And so it gave me an assuredness of being like, oh yeah, you know, like none of, none of the petty stuff matters. Like this is, this is, this is, you know, why I was born and my family has done this in different ways. And so it may not have looked like, you know, coaching did not exist when my great grandmother was a midwife and fertility healer, you know, a few blocks away Mm -hmm. from where I'm sitting today, but the way that she cared for her community and they cared for her, it was the same work in a different iteration. Right. That's amazing. And and with what you're doing in your life and career, do you feel like both of your parents have been very supportive of that since it, it is it, it seems like it's a similar vein? Well, I think that they're they're supportive now. They're extremely supportive, but you know, all of the stereotypes about immigrant parents <laughs> at least as I've yes, seen are ring true. true. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my, I remember when I was in undergraduate um, in college, my dad, it seemed like it, it really in my brain seems like he would come by once a week to talk about becoming a lawyer. I'm sure it was much mm-hmm. less than that, but it really it felt to me like, OK, here he comes. And he, and he would try to work it into a conversation and make it a casual thing and all of that. Yeah. And so for a very long time, you know felt like they were they were hoping that I was going to take another path but I think mm-hmm. that now that you know it's working out that it's like they're very excited and very proud and you know my my biggest supporters and but even with that you know I know that for them that it's just that, that they're coming from a place of love and no one wants to feel like that their kids are going to suffer or be destitute or something like yeah. that, you know? So that's, that's the positive side of it. The negative side of it is that I personally, as a firstborn daughter, um, inherited a lot of messages around your worth being tied into achievement, um, like my mother would tell, you know, me too. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, where it's like, you know, mm-hmm. how, you know, how, uh, how, you, how productive you are and how, how much you've achieved. And, you know, and so being able to free myself of that, you know, value, you know, 
Yeah, your self worth yes. tying to that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. For you, how has that journey been? My love, I want to take a break and let you know that we just launched some new products on the Lavender Shop, and I am so excited about them. First, we have the Bloom Hardcover Notebooks. They come in three styles. These are beautifully made notebooks with a floral photo and gentle reminder on each cover. My favorite is the one that says, you're exactly where you're meant to be. It's the perfect reminder to have on your desk. I have mine on my nightstand so I can journal before I go to sleep. We've also launched the new TBH deck. So this is a deck of cards that are 120 prompts to spark honest conversations and deepen your relationship with yourself and others. You can use them to guide your journaling sessions or go beyond small talk and spark thoughtful conversations with the people in your life. Bloom into your best self and shop the new launch at shop.lavendaire.com. Again, that's shop.lavendaire.com. Uh, I've learned to, I'm letting it go. I'm in the process. It's something that I realized. I mean, I think I've always been the achiever, the responsible older sister, you know, the firstborn. Um, But it's only maybe the past three or so years that I'm really learning to let it go. And it's a process, but the awareness is the first step. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Awareness is the first step and it is absolutely a process. You know, like I said earlier that, you know, there's not like a hallelujah, I'm healed moment, but it's, you know, it's, it's like, okay, you know, learning how to let certain things go little by little. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to move on to talk about your book, African Goddess Initiation. I actually have it here on my desk. I think, well, first of all, the cover is so cool. And I I browsed through it and it, I love how you, like, first of all, there's all these actual African goddesses for each chapter and you have rituals that are both modern and ancient in here. And so I just want to know, like, how did you create this book? How, what kind of research came, went into this? Thank you so much. Um, everything went into creating that book. I feel like it was absolutely a divine assignment from my ancestors. And it's interesting, like sometimes when I'm in the middle of a book, like I get kind of paranoid because I'm wanting this work to come out into the world. And so I'm like, oh my God, don't let anything happen to me before, you know, like telling my sister, if anything (laughs) happens to me, you know, here's the stuff on the book, put the book out there. You know, Mm -hmm. people are like, that's, you know, the last thing that we would be worried about at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, I did many different layers of research. So there were the spiritual layers of research, you know, my own personal spirituality and spiritual journey and the things that, you know, that I have, you know, downloaded or channeled, however you want to uh, phrase it. Then there was, you know, I have a very strong academic background. And, you know, my mother was a teacher here in Guyana. And so coming from educators and, and writers, you know, the academic doing scholarly and academic research, um, which in this area hasn't been done, you know, to a lot of this degree. And then I did um, first first person sources. I I interviewed healers and worked with healers, you know, in throughout the African diaspora in Haiti, in wow. West Africa, you know, in Guyana. And so it was a very multifaceted thing where during the pandemic, you know, this work was my salvation to be able to live, breathe, you know, and, you know, escape into, you know, um, escape into this beautiful ancestral journey. And so, yeah, so that was, so, so I love that you have the book. And for me, the, the fact that there are those ancient rituals and then ways that we can add ritual to our lives. I say that this is not a book so much as that you read. It's a book that you do, you know, the same way with a cookbook that you, you, you know, you do a cookbook, you know, you do mm-hmm. this book. It's that ritual is the way that we engage with the sacred. Wow. That's amazing that you had so many layers of research in creating the process. How long did it take to complete this book? I'm just curious. It took a lot shorter than one would think. I think because I was working in such a concentrated fashion, it took nine, about nine, Mm. nine months, um, Wow. For, for my portion of it, of course, with the production part mm-hmm. of it and, you know, all of that and the cover and all of that and, and making the index, et cetera, all of that took longer. But my portion took nine months. And 
Wow. As I said, it was during it's the- a literal baby. Yeah, it is a baby. It is a baby. Yeah. And it, I think that during, because it was during quarantine, you know, um, that the rest of the world was shut out, you know, there wasn't anywhere else mm-hmm. to be able to go physically. So I think that it all unfolded the way that it needed to. I love that. Can you share maybe your favorite ritual or just any maybe, you know, teasers for our listeners so they get a feel for what's in this book? Sure. So as you mentioned, each section has different goddesses from the African diaspora. So a lot of people who do goddess work are familiar with the Yoruba goddesses, you know, from the Yoruba culture in West Africa. But that that is only just the tip of the, you know, the tip of the the iceberg, you know. So there are goddesses from Northern Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, you know, and in each section, each goddess has a gift for us, a gift of empowerment, a gift of enlightenment. And it's really, really interesting because a lot of things that people would not necessarily associate with African culture that you think, oh, well, that's new age or woo woo or, you know, like crystals or whatever are a very much a part of many sacred African traditions. Africa, as you mentioned, it's not a, it's not a monolith. It's not one section or one country. It's 54 plus countries. And then all of us throughout the African diaspora. So my parents, for example, like I said, they grew up here in Guyana, South America, where I am right now. They had an African experience here while Mm -hmm. they were in Guyana. And so ritual, um, One of my favorite rituals in the book is in the Oshun section. Oshun is the goddess of love and femininity and sensuality and, you know, all of those things. And this is actually Oshun here on the cover of my my cards. And so the Oshun ritual in the book is the sweetening jar, which is a well-known ritual throughout, um, throughout the African diaspora and the Caribbean and also, you know, down in Southern, Southern United States and, you know, West Africa. So a sweetening jar is, you know, it's a lot of practical magic, the way that uh, a lot of traditional African magic works. So if you are wanting to sweeten the energy around something that you are manifesting and you're calling forward into your life, you put it into, I'm going to do a simplified version. You put it into a, mm-hmm. a sacred jar that you have consecrated and blessed. And, you know, we're going into the new moon. So this is a great energy for that. And so the same way that you would make a vision board that would have visual representations of your intentions, you would create Pick, call this a vision jar, basically. So you can write out sacred intentions of what you are calling in on slips of paper, put them into the jar with sweetening elements. So like honey, mm-hmm. which is what Oshun <gasps> wow. represents. Yes. Yeah, so honey, um, brown sugar. You can use chocolate kisses if it's a love ritual, a self-love ritual, you know, things that are sweet. You can use cookies, using all of those things and putting them into this like um, this this jar with your intentions. And you would create a ritual where if you have a goddess altar, for example, it could be on the ritual on the on the the ritual could be on the altar for seven days. It could be you know, four days over the new moon, you know, um, you could write a check to yourself, you know, make up a check, um, and put it, or, you know, even, even because, you know, we don't use checks so much, but you could draw a debit card. I was doing that showing a client, you could draw (laughs) a debit card and put it in there and have this, you know, this, this relationship for the next seven days where you're adding your sacred intentions and you're sweetening them up. And, you know, rituals are all about the energy that you put, the ceremony of it, blowing on it so that your life force energy, which is called Ashe, your Ashe is in the jar. And it's a really beautiful and simple, simple, uh, simple ritual. (laughs) I love that. It's it's like a visual, creative way to manifest. And when I hear this, I mean, I your website is literally called Womb Manifesting. And you hear about manifest, but I, I guess I didn't realize that it was so embedded in these cultures that like, you know, African culture has all of these rituals that are similar to, to this. So 
Yeah. I mean, can you speak on that? Because when we learn about manifesting, uh, you might agree that it is whitewashed, the type of spirituality we're exposed to, at least in America. So I have no idea about the like spirituality cult, you know, that culture in other areas of the world. So can you just lay, you know, share some insight on that? Absolutely. I had an experience with one of my spiritual teachers who was in the, he's in the Akan culture and he is based in Ghana, West Africa. And he was talking, we were talking about manifesting and he was giving me a very specific ritual that involved a tree and involved assuming that, you know, the, the, how the, the, assuming that the, that what you wanted was going to appear and going to the tree and doing, and I, and I said, oh my gosh, you're talking about manifestation. And he said, no, I'm talking about being, I'm talking about creating. Wow. And I was like, yeah, but you're talking wow. about manifestation. It was all the same yeah. thing, but it was a different language, yeah. you know, a different way oh of relating, gosh. relating it. And it is all the same. Like there's a lot of, you know, for example, what is called trance in a lot of um, West African um, nations call it trance, that it's meditation, you know, it's visualization. Yeah, there is yes. a, in Zulu culture, there's a consciousness that is called Umbilini consciousness that is very much with the same as, um, very similar to Kundalini that is, you know, in Hindu culture. And I think that it's because the greats, you know, the, the, the ancients were all pulling from the same, you know, the same energy stream. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, this is all very, very much, very much a part of African culture, global African culture. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this project, because I have been the beneficiary of, I benefit from many different cultures. Like I just mentioned Hinduism, you know, with chakra work and, you know, yoga and, you know, um, with Taoism and with, you know, um, so much, so much, so many different other cultures with feng shui, you know, so many different cultural gifts that I benefit from. And so when people say, oh, well, can I read this book if I'm not African? I say, absolutely. Because, you know, for all of us to receive the gifts that we are needing, you know, from each other is a beautiful part of our human journey and experience. I love that message. I agree that this needs to go out to more people because I don't, it's, it's not exposed. You know, people don't realize, I, I mean, at least for me, I have not heard that much in African spirituality. Yeah. And I love how you explained it. It's all, t it's all the same. It's coming from the same source, yeah. but in different languages, yes. you know, the, the me different <laughs> messengers in different languages throughout time. That's a beautiful, beautiful idea. It is. Um, it is. And I just yeah. want to just add, Eileen, that, you know, it's not accidental that you haven't heard this, that my mm -hmm. one of the things I did not know about my father's experience growing up until I interviewed him for the book is that when he was growing up in British Guiana at the time, which is now Guyana, you know, that African spirituality was illegal. And so oh there gosh. were raids I didn't know that. where, you know, they had to hide their altars, hide their candles, hide <gasps> their drums. This is in my father's lifetime. So this is not, wow. you know, I knew that this had happened, but yeah. I thought it was like some ancient thing. I didn't know that this was my father's wow. experience in his lifetime. And it was the same very much um, through throughout um, colonialized Africa on the continent as well, you know, where... And, and in the United States, where African spirituality was permanently demonized. And so we think of, you know, things that are evil and bad and all of that stuff. And, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't by accident. That is oh, that's so sad to think about, but it's reality. Yeah. And, and that's why when I look at African-American culture, I don't really see much of like this. Like it hasn't, it seems like it hasn't been passed down. Oh, all of but these it is. And that's, that's and the thing that yeah. even like when we talk about twerking, you know, there are cultural oh. dances where I can draw a direct response. Hip hop, hip hop music, you know, rap music. You know, when we look at there's, there's a culture called griot culture, which is the storytelling culture where, you know, the casts of storytellers, storytellers would marry other storytellers and they would mm. each have thousands of years of tribal history and stories that they told through, you know, using song as a way to, to memorize and pass down all of this oral literature. And so it's, it's there. We just didn't know what we oh, were looking at. That. It's all there. 
Oh my God. I love the way you put it. That is beautiful. I (laughs) thank you for saying that. I'm sure that inspires people because yeah, someone, for example, might feel disconnected from their culture, but but it, like you said, it is there. You just didn't realize yeah. it's there. Yeah. And it's true. Twerking is, is your first chakra. It's working yes. it out. Like I, yes. there's a spiritual purpose for <laughs> it. it. Absolutely <laughs> I get is. it. And one of the cool things that I found as I, you know, um, this is, this is the first book actually in this, in this genre that, um, also examines not only African culture on the continent, but as I said, throughout the African diaspora, the Caribbean, you know, the, the Spanish speaking, English speaking, Portuguese speaking, French speaking Caribbean. And it was really beautiful and magical to find that stories that my dad told me that were, you know, Guyanese stories were altered and were slightly different, but were told to children of Af- African descent in, you know, the, the, the Gucci, the, Gucci, the, the Gori Islands, the Gullah people who are right off the coast of, um, of South, um, South Carolina that have a lot of African wow. retention culture. The same exact stories were told in Haiti and in Brazil with slight changes. And it's just, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. I love that. If you think about that, then the diaspora, it, it is so powerful, is. right? Like, Wow, just the the web of culture. Yes. I just I love hearing that <laughs> stories like that. Ah, oh, okay. Um, so I do want to share a little bit more advice for our listeners. So, is there other? Can you share another takeaway for our listeners on how they could tap into their inner goddess? Yes. So I I laughed at you there because you said you know the web, the interconnected web, and you had no yeah. way of knowing that the specific story that I was talking about that you know in all of these different cultures was the story of Anansi who appears as a spider. You know the spider god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so wow. that's so funny that you said the web. So that's why I laughed. Um, it's connected in some way. Wow, that's beautiful. Is. So one of the ways that, you know, if you are on a self-love journey, which I imagine everyone who's listening to this probably is in some, sh- some way, yeah. shape or form. One of the things you want to make sure to do is shadow work. Shadow work is mm. an important part of my culture, an important part of, you know, any kind of spiritual work that you are going to be doing. And the way that it happened throughout a lot of the Western and Southern African um, experiences are, you know, with the, the coming of age journeys or rituals that people would go on, you know, they would, they would be like maybe for 14 days where you would go and, and a part of it, you know, involved doing shadow work, facing the parts of yourself that you thought were unlovable, the parts of yourself that you stuffed down. So for us, Mm. you know, everyone who is listening to this, you know, we, we like the pretty Instagrammable side of, you know, spirituality. Look at my cards, look at my crystals. This is all so beautiful. I'm here. I'm doing yoga. I'm on a mountain, whatever it is, but you're not really going to have a personal breakthrough until you address your shadow. Everyone has shadow parts of ourselves unloved parts of ourselves that we stuffed down, that that we were told by the well-meaning people who raised us were not acceptable. You know, you and I were talking about Mm -hmm. our first generation eldest daughter journeys, you know, so there was a lot of stuffing down of, you know, I'll speak to my experience, you know, speaking loudly is not ladylike or, you know, you don't want to make waves. You don't want to, you know, make other people uncomfortable. You don't want to, you know, a lot of people pleaser energy I inherited. And so those kinds of things for me are my shadow self. And so one of the ways that you could find your shadow, if you're listening to this and you're like, hmm, What I don't know that I have a shadow. Look at the people and the behaviors that really annoy you and piss you off Mm. and disgust you and trigger you. That is where your shadow is. You know, so for me, it's, you know, if there are, you know, there are, you know, people who seem very loud and aggressive and whatever, like, and I'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe that people are like that. It's because, you know, for me, there's a part of me that was yearning and wanting to be like that and needing to be outspoken and wanting to be able to own my voice and claim my voice. So you want to look at, that's, that's a great place to start. Look at the, the, the behaviors, the, the ideas, the thoughts that trigger you in a big way 
and then look yeah. for where are those parts of yourself? Where did you stuff those parts of yourself down? And what, 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 how do those things serve you? So if, for example, it's, you know, being a, you know, an aggressive, mean person, which I wouldn't want to be, but if I think about, okay, how has, are there, is, is there any time where being aggressive, um, in that way could serve me? Yeah, there are, there are, there are times where I've had to stand up for myself and get what I want, or, you know, I was standing somewhere and someone cut me in a line or people were, you know, ignoring me and I had to assert myself. So there are gifts in that. So finding gifts in the unloved shadowy parts of ourselves is a wonderful place to start. Mm. I love that. I love that you brought up, look at what annoys you and triggers yes. you because I'm sure everybody <laughs> has something that annoys them. And it's usually this, the same things that pop yeah. up. So instead of avoiding them or getting angry, like really look at it. Okay. What is that revealing about me? Yeah, absolutely. And I have within the book, in the shadow part of the book, there are, it's called the the temple, your inner temple of shadows. There are exercises and mantras that you could do specifically to do a deep dive around this work. Um, people have told me that because the, there's an audio book as well. So having the mm. book, having the audio book, and if you're someone that's into Oracle cards, having the Oracle, Oracle cards and working with them together can be really powerful and helpful. I love that. Um, another question I have for you is, I'm I'm curious, what has been the most difficult part of your self-love journey and, and how did you overcome it? Mm. Wow. I think the most difficult part of my self-love journey has been in dealing with my romantic relationships. You know, mm. it's easy to so? it's easy to, you know, when you're if you're by yourself to <laughs> think that you're like a paragon of goodness and spiritual wonder, right? Yeah. Cause you're not dealing with anyone. It's like, well, okay, I'm meditating. I'm doing all these things. Wow. Look at me. I'm so <laughs> evolved and ascended, <laughs> you know? And then as the late great Louise Hay would say that you go out into the parking lot and call someone, you know, <laughs> a name or whatever, cause they, you know, they pulled their car out in front of you. So it's in our, in our interconnectedness with other people that we really see the things that, that are coming up in order to be healed. And so for me in particular, you know, romantic relationships have been a place where I have continually been doing the work and having to do, you know, a lot of deep dive work. And I think that it's because, you know, my well-meaning, amazing parents who I love, you know, did not always have the easiest marriage. They're still together, thankfully. And, you know, and I, like I said, I love them very much, but I saw a lot of unhealed energy, a lot of, you know, um, unhealthy relationship energy from the both of them when I was growing mm. up. And the, one of the great things that they have taught me is that you can, you're never too old to, to, to learn, you know, they are still learning and they are still evolving. But mm. <laughs> during my formative years, <laughs> you know, there were a lot of problematic things that were happening. They were breaking up and getting back together and breaking up and getting back together. And so there are a lot of those things that I'm having to heal and work on in my relationships. And, you know, it's just we we all have something, you know, we all have stuff that, you know, that that is a yeah. part of our journey. This this beautiful baby girl, my beautiful daughter who is on <laughs> my lap. I want her to be I love to never experience like a moment of stress or trauma or strife in her whole life. I, <laughs> if I could, you know, I would protect her from everything. But that's not the way of the world. In, in order for us to, yeah. to live and to grow, you know, the things that we consider our mess most often become our message. So they are yeah. gifts in strange wrapping paper. Yeah. And, and I, for the listeners who aren't seeing the video, Aviola does have her baby girl of three months on her lap, which I think is so sweet. And, and Aviola, you're amazing for being a mom coming on a <laughs> podcast you. at this time. Cause I would, I can't even imagine. Um, but let's talk about that experience because as a new mother, and, and you're someone who is all about self-love and empowerment. Yeah. How do you plan to teach your daughter these things? And do you, I know you want to be protective, but do you feel like it's almost impossible? You can't protect them from 
hurt and trauma. Uh, like, is that kind of stuff inevitable? It is. What is your perspective on that? It is inevitable. But even hearing you say that, I'm like, oh, it's not impossible. You I know. know. She's so precious. And, I know. You know, and just amazing. And I'm sure that's how your parents felt about you too. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. And yeah. so, you know, one of the things that I that I do, for example, with her already at three months, we do daily gratitude list. You know, so every day I'm like, okay, Ruby, what's your <laughs> gratitude so list today? So today I'll be like, remember we were listening to God as Eileen as we were on the podcast together oh you know gosh. so every day I'm like okay here are your three things that were you know on your gratitude list you know and I'm reading to her positive books already and it's so funny because some people in my family are like you know she doesn't know what you're what, what's going on I'm like she does know you know these are the building she does, blocks. She she does. does know yeah. and so I also <laughs> do you know mantras with her when I'm when I'm dressing her for example I'm getting her dressed and I'm like you know Ruby you are an amazing girl. You could do anything that you set your mind to. You are just magnificent. You're the smartest person I know. You are so beautiful. You're so kind and yeah. so generous. You know, like I speak of these words into her heart. I love that. But even, you know, even with that, you know, the other day I caught myself with, with certain things that I was saying, you know, I was saying, you know, you could be, you could do anything you set your mind to. You could be the president. You could be whatever. Then I realized, oh, wait, okay. I don't want to build in also the same, you know, um, a pressure, pressure and expectations, right? right? Yeah. So I realized mm-hmm. that it was that as well, like being like, you know, you're phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Cause I was like, you're an achiever. You're an amazing. And I was like, I said, and I, and I was like, I caught myself and I said, but you know, anything you want to do or not do is fine. You can mm-hmm. be whoever you want to yeah. be. You can be whatever you want to be, you know? And so realizing yeah. that part of it, you know, if we don't heal it, we pass it on. Mhm. Wow. I first of all, you are so cute. That is so cute <laughs> that you you really <laughs> You're embedding all of this positivity, all of this manifesting so early on in her life. I, I want to fast forward like 18 years and see <laughs> what Ruby becomes. Um, but I, yeah, thank you for doing that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know. And I guess moving forward, like knowing that, um, I guess, unexpected like challenges may come into her life. You as a mother, how how do you plan on helping her heal or do you believe in just letting them go through their own journey what is your stance on that oh no i'm i'm helicopter <laughs> you don't have to go through <laughs> your own journey i'm here <laughs> oh okay, so, okay so there there is a culture that at this moment is escaping me but it is i believe it's the kung culture in southern west africa where the first three months of a child's life is considered, you know, the, the next uh, trimester, you know, so it's, it's, Mm. you replicate the patterns of still being in the womb. And so I have been carrying, I lift my daughter up, I carry her, I hold her a lot, which to my culture in Guyana, to my, you know, Afro-Guyanese cultural heritage is horrible parenting. You know, the first thing everyone said as soon as she came home is not too much hand. You don't want to hold her too much. Mm -hmm. You don't want to, you know, I'm like, oh no, you don't want to take too much care of her and have her feel that she's (laughs) loved and that someone really, you know, (laughs) adores her and that she's really supported, you know, but it it was, it's very much a a message of, you know, just put the baby down and let her fend for herself. And I believe the complete, you know, opposite, you know, I know from my own experience that there'll come a, a, a time where she wants nothing to do with me. And so in the meanwhile, before we get to that point, you know, I'm just going to try to instill, you know, as much through conscious parenting and through me educating myself, you know, around being her mother as much as possible, as much of a foundation as I could give her, you know, the better. And it starts with a lot of things with me having to go first. So if I want her to be Mm -hmm. strong and courageous And all of those things, I've got to go first. So I'll share with you really quickly before we go. There was a lizard problem here on this property. Oh, my God, it's giving me chills to talk about it even. (laughs) But, you know, so there are all these lizards everywhere. And everyone here thinks it's really hilarious that me as the American come back home, you know, is freaked out by lizards. So I even tried to like hire a cab driver to come and like remove the lizards and people laugh it off because they think I'm joking. And I'm like, no, I'm not joking. Help me these lizards. (laughs) Right. So (laughs) there was like this dead lizard and it was in the house and I couldn't get anyone to come and remove it. And I, you know, bolstered myself and reminded myself, I'm Ruby's mommy. 
and I can do anything. And so I just kept on chanting that. It's like, I am Ruby's mommy. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. It's like, you know, and, and was able to do it. And, you know, something that is as little as that for me is just a lesson in how she is informing and educating my life. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the less, the growth and the learning continues. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I love that. So do you have any final words that you want to share with our audience today? Yes. I want to say get into a circle or community. I love that you are here, you know, as a part of the Lavender experience, you know, having community is so important. A lot of us are on these journeys or begin these journeys by ourselves and think that, you know, that we're, you know, the only person, you know, the black sheep in your family or your friend group or whatever it is, you know, instead of being by yourself and being the black sheep in one group, come and be the rainbow unicorn (laughs) in a group of other Mm. rainbow unicorns that will see you for who you are and and love and appreciate you. And so, for example, I have my annual retreat that I do um, every year that is coming up that is in June. It's called the Goddess of Manifesting Tobago Retreat, um, Rituals, Rebirth, and Reggae. So I invite you to come be a part of that or a part of my Mawu's Goddess Mystery School, which right now is on hiatus, but which will be coming back um, in a few weeks. There are all kinds of ways to be in community. If Even if I'm not your jam, you know, find another um, retreat or another um, experience where you can get together with like-minded people and let's change the world together. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> all right, Aviella, where can we find you online? So come play with me anywhere, including Instagram, um, Pinterest, YouTube, et cetera, at Abiola TV, where the TV stands for transformation and victory. I also have a podcast that I want to invite you to. It's called the Goddess Temple Podcast. Come and listen to the Goddess Temple Podcast. You can see episodes uploaded to YouTube as well. And my site, as you mentioned, is womanifesting.com. So like manifesting.com, but womanifesting.com. But Instagram is a really good first base and a first place to come and hang out. And then I have a free self-love kit that if you go to womanifesting.com, you can just follow the links and and download the free self-love kit. Amazing. And everybody, as always, I'll put all the links in the show notes down below. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I know you have a lot of things to worry about with your baby. You're in Guyana. (laughs) So I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. I I enjoyed it thoroughly and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of your community as well. Same. Thank you so much. Bye.